I want to do a general overview of the application cycle because a lot of students get very confused about primary application, secondary application, what all of that means, timelines, and all of that. One of the best things that you can be doing in preparation for your application cycle, whether you're applying this year, next year, or two years from now, or three years from now, whenever you're applying, is to start thinking of these moments in your journey. Whether that's what planted the seed to kind of exposure to healthcare and thinking about being in healthcare, uh, whether it is a story around being a leader, a story around failure, a story around working in a group, a story around your strengths, your weaknesses, whatever it may be, the more that you can start thinking in stories, the better your application cycle will go. The better your application will tell your story, the better your interview will show who you are. Start journaling. If you're not now, start journaling everything that you're doing, whether you're scribing, volunteering, whatever you're doing, start journaling. So when you're done for the day or the morning, if you're working overnight, whatever it is, open up a notebook, open up day one app on a, uh, on a device, whatever it may be, and, and just obviously track your hours and, and contact information, all that stuff you need for your application. But also ask the question, what did this mean to me? Why was this memorable for me? What a lot of you do is go, I folded sheets. I got water for Mrs. Smith. And it's, all, it's just a list of things you did and not the emotions behind what it was that you did and why it mattered to you. I wanna do a general overview of the application cycle because a lot of students get very confused about primary application, secondary application, what all of that means, timelines, and all of that. So beginning of May is open season for the application cycle. And that is the day where you should immediately start doing a few things. And that is um, create your account. You can't request your transcripts until you open up the application uh, because the transcript request form that you will print out from the application service will have a unique number on there for you that has to go with it or else you get lost in the matrix. And there's another thing you can start doing if you're not using Interfolio and that's starting to request letters of recommendations being uploaded. So each application service has the ability to upload letters of evaluation uh, directly to the application service or you can use a site like Interfolio where the, the writer submits it once to Interfolio and then Interfolio sends it out to everyone. Uh, if you're using Interfolio, which I typically recommend because then you can start requesting letters now and not need to worry about putting pressure on the letter writers to submit it at a specific time, um, you, can, you can start uploading now to Interfolio and then when you're ready to submit it to your application service. You can do that. Uh, all right, so transcripts, LORs, again, directly uploaded. And that is about it as soon as it opens. So once it opens, you go and create an account. You put in all your information. You put in your, your, all of your classes. You can start filling in your extracurriculars, your personal statement, et cetera. You can submit your DO anywhere in here. But as soon as June rolls around, and the last couple of years, it's been the end of May, actually. May 31st, I think, was this last year. You could submit your MD application. With rolling admissions, which most schools do in the States, you submit your application, they review your application, they invite you for an interview, they accept you earlier than the person who submits it after you. So the earlier your application is in, the earlier that they can review your application, the earlier they can invite you for an interview, the earlier that you can be accepted. Rolling admissions is very important because medical schools only have a certain number of slots for interviews. So they say at the beginning of the year, okay, we're interviewing these 20 dates, whatever that is for each school. And at every date we have 20 spots, right? We're gonna interview 400 people this year. 
we are um, gonna have 20 days. As soon as those days are filled up, that's it, we're done. And so if you apply and your application is finalized the day after they just filled that 400th seat, you're SOL. Rolling admissions, you have to look at a complete application. Your application is complete when you've submitted your primary, you've submitted your secondaries, or just paid the school money if they don't have any secondaries. You've completed Casper, if the school wants Casper. Your LORs are all in. And your MCAT score is in, and you don't have a pending score. All of that will then typically trigger the school to say, okay, Johnny's application is complete. It can be reviewed now, okay? So a lot of people will get here, they'll submit it and go, okay, whew, I'm done. And then the secondary is just sit and sit and sit and sit. And oh, I'm gonna take the MCAT in September. And I don't wanna do any secondaries because I'm gonna take the MCAT in September, so I wanna focus on studying. They take their MCAT and then they start working on their secondaries. And by the time they're done with all of their secondaries, they've been sitting on them for a while. The medical schools are like, oh, I guess you don't really care about us. We're not gonna care about you. Once you submit your applications, uh, mid-June, Historically, the DO apps go out to the schools. So you can submit your DO application at the beginning of May, but the first wave of applications historically hasn't gone out until the, first, uh, the, the middle of, of June. And then same thing for the MD applications. Um, so you have late June is uh, the first wave of MD applications go out to schools. And so if you are on top of things, you can theoretically fill out your DO application first, right? You can be done in April, <laughs> have, have your personal statement done, all of your extracurricular descriptions done. You could be done with everything and twiddling your thumbs, which is amazing. <clears throat> Open up your DO application, fill it out, double check it, triple check it, submit it early May, then start working on your MD application, submit it early June, and then start working on your secondary applications. So secondary applications start coming in around here. Until that first wave goes out, the schools don't know who you are, don't know that you've applied, don't know anything about you. So when you submit your application, what you're doing is you're getting in line to be verified. With the application, you're filling in all of your grades from your transcripts. And so when you're requesting these official transcripts, you want to request unofficial ones sent directly to you as well. And you're going off of those transcripts, and you are filling in on the application service all the classes you've taken. If your transcripts have classes removed because your school does grade replacement, add them into your application because the school, the, the medical schools want every single class. So secondaries come out. Between submission here and submission here, you're pre-writing secondaries. If you apply to 20 schools, Let's assume every school has a secondary that they send you with four essay prompts. That's a lot of essays that you're gonna be writing. So if you can do that beforehand, that's great. Um, if you guys don't know the resources on my website, secondaryapps.com will take you directly to my secondary essay database. It's a, just a free resource on the website that is kept up to date from you guys when you guys get your secondary essays this coming year. If it's different than the previous year that you saw on the website, you just submit the changes to us. We update the site for the next group of students. Early decision is basically going to one medical school and saying, I love you, I want to marry you, you're the only person for me. 
will you marry me? You cannot apply to any other medical school during that courting process. And so you are doing all of these things for one school only. And a school has to have early decision. Not every school allows an early decision. A lot of schools will want you to contact the admissions office and have a conversation with them. And sometimes they'll, sometimes they'll do like a pre-interview with you to see if you're even qualified enough to be an early applicant. It's nice if the school does that because if, if you're not qualified to be an early, uh, early decision applicant, then it will increase your chances of, of getting into medical school because during this process, you're only applying to one school and you're losing out on the rolling admissions to the other schools. And so early decision, decision comes out uh, at the latest at the end of September. And so at the end of September, you find out early decision if you were accepted or not. And if you aren't, then you can apply to other medical schools. The only time I typically recommend early decision is, especially for non-trads, if you have really strong roots in the community, if you have really strong ties to the medical school, um, and usually if you have strong stats as well. Applying early decision doesn't make it easier stat-wise for you. So just keep that in mind. DO acceptances can start coming out as soon as they interview you. So if you go on a DO interview, two days later, you could get a phone call saying, congratulations, you've been accepted to medical school. <clears throat> um, MD acceptances are October 15th, historically every year. And so a lot of people, if you're on social media, you'll see students you say, I was accepted, I was accepted. And people who only applied MD are like, I'm so confused. <laughs> How are you accepted? I thought it was October 15th. So that's, that's typically where those students are, are getting those acceptances, are to DO schools. Expect to spend, if you're <clears throat> applying to 20 or so schools, expect to spend upwards of four to $5,000 with application fees, secondary fees, MCAT prep, travel costs, right? All of the food and lodging and everything. Are there scholarships that can help with applying? So probably not a scholarship, the, it was the FAP. Yeah. So the financial assistance program, the DO application is very stingy. <laughs> they, only let, they only cover the cost of one school. So the DO application I think is 170 or $185 and that includes one school. <clears throat> FAP, if you qualify for it, will waive that fee for one school. The MD application, if you qualify through the AAMC through FA, for FAP, um, and if you just Google like AAMC FAP requirements, uh, depending on family size and where you live and all this stuff, there's a, there's a threshold that you have to meet. It's I think three times the poverty limit based on family size. The AAMC, I'm not sure about the DO application, the AAMC requires your parents' information, even if you're a non-trad, if you're married, you have kids, they don't care, they want your parents' information. There are ways to waive that if you need to, um, but it's hard. The MD application, if you qualify for FAP, will cover up to 20 medical schools. So it's the cost of the application, which is 170-ish dollars, and then typically it's another 40 or so dollars for each school that you add. The FAP will cover the first 20 schools, which is cool. It was 15, they increased it to 20 last year, I think. Um, outside of that, I have my kind of scholarship that I do twice a year, premedscholarship.com. It's an essay scholarship, essay contest. Um, but that's all that I know of. How do I get letters of rec if I haven't established a relationship with the teachers? You're going to have to ask the people who will write the letters that are required from the schools that you're applying to. So every medical school will have different requirements for letters of recommendations. And so you need to make sure that you meet those requirements. Now, some of you may uh, be part of a school that has a committee where a committee letter will be written for you. Um, typically, that'll meet the needs of everything. Uh, but 
the, the general rule of thumb that I like to talk about is two science and one non-science letter. So if you don't have that relationship, it's hard to get a good letter of recommendation. Sometimes you just have to get what you can get um, and go from there. Ideally, you're getting letters from people when you ask them, can you write me a strong letter of recommendation? Um, if you have people in your past that may meet the requirement of a science letter, a non-science letter, whatever that may be, who you think can write you a really strong letter of recommendation, I would reconnect with those people now and say, hey, right, I'm applying to medical school in a few months. I would love for you, because of XYZ, for you to write me a letter of recommendation when the application cycle opens up. I'd love to reconnect with you to, to let you know what I've been up to. Can you do that? Should I reuse letters of rec? I generally recommend to get new letters, to write a new personal statement, to continue to explore getting extracurriculars, shadowing, getting clinical experience, all that stuff. Because you don't know what it is about your application that's missing, what, what it is in your application that schools didn't like. And maybe one of your letters just didn't resonate well. Um, if you know for sure, like, oh, like Dr. Smith's letter's killer, I definitely want Dr. Smith to write me another letter of recommendation, go for it. So when you're writing your personal statement, your goal is to, is to tell your story of why you're doing this. That story is, is your seed. And so you tell that story in a paragraph. And then you tell another story of a time where you're like, okay, I was in a position where I didn't know anything and I want to help, or I think I want to help, right? That's why it's a seed. It's, it's planting this kind of, I think I may want to explore this. So then you talk about a time where you started exploring it and you were like, oh yeah, like this is getting real. This is what I want. I want more, please. It doesn't have to be a timeline. You can start with a, with a, a watering of the seed and go back to a seed and go back to a watering of the seed. There's no specific timeline needed. What you just want to make sure you're getting across is kind of where in your life this stuff is happening. If you have any sort of huge red flags in your application, you may want to talk about them in your personal statement. Um, and if you need to do that, do it very, very, very briefly in a sentence or two. I want to know why you want to be a physician. Period. End of story. And. How many of you are in here? 12? Something? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I want to know wh why and what experiences you've had and why they've impacted you. You all may have the same experiences. Right? At, at, at some point, we are very limited with what you can do as a pre-med. And therefore, pre-meds are going to EMT, they're scribing, they're volunteering at hospice, they're volunteering in the emergency department. Right? There's only a certain set of things that you can do to get the clinical experience you need to prove to yourself that this is what you want. And so your stories at a superficial level may all sound very similar, but it's, it's how you are telling the story and how you are reflecting on that story as to why it impacted you that separates every one of you. For those of you applying to DO schools, it changed last year that the DO application now allows 5,300 characters for the personal statement. It's not changed in the book yet. It still says 4,500 characters. My assumption is that the DO gods got together and said, hey, how do we get more students applying to DO schools? Let's make it easier for them to just copy and paste their personal statement from their MD application. All right, so now it's 5,300 characters. I don't think you need to write a DO-specific personal statement. The goal of the DO application and personal statement is still, why do you want to be a doctor? How do you balance school and life experience? I think the line should always be on the side of being a student and a person, because that is, at, at the end of the day, what is going to help separate you from everyone else. Okay. Uh, where the line gets drawn for most students is 
where your time is being taken up too much by these other things, and they could be healthcare related things as well, that your grades are starting to slip, that your MCAT prep is starting to slip, that you're too busy to finish your personal statement, your extracurriculars, your secondaries, that you're being part of the, the intramural softball team is taking up too much time that you have zero shadowing hours in the last six months and yet you're sitting here going, I want to be a doctor, this is all I've ever wanted to do. Right? When your words start separating from your actions, that's where the line gets a little fuzzy. How important is shadowing? What does shadowing do for you? Yeah. What it actually is, yeah. right? Not what you see on TV. Right. Not what you see from that small snippet of, of being a volunteer, whatever that may be. And I tell the same thing to PAs, to nurses, to NPs. You still need to shadow a physician because you work with them super closely and you see everything that he or she does at the bedside. But as soon as they walk away, you don't know what's going on. And maybe you don't like that. And you're like, oh crap, why am, why am I going to be a doctor? This is not very fun. The goal of shadowing and getting clinical experience is not for the medical schools. And as soon as you can realize that it's not for the medical schools, that it's for you, then you're like, okay, that makes it better. You feel better doing it. It's to prove to yourself that you're gonna spend the next four years of your life going through medical school, getting a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt because you want to. The worst thing that can happen is getting a couple years into this process and going, oh crap, like I don't like taking care of patients. <laughs> I just thought I did. I told myself I did because I really, I've always held on to this core belief that I wanted to be a doctor, but I don't. Can volunteering count as clinical experience? It's a good, good question. Clinical experience has nothing to do with paid or volunteering. Clinical experience is clinical experience, whether you're getting paid or not. Is one better than the other? No. Clinical experience is clinical experience. On the application, you'll mark it as paid or, or not paid, but it doesn't matter. How do you compile miscellaneous volunteering? Yeah, so it's very similar to, are any of you student athletes? Or were student, yeah. So usually as a student athlete, or if you were in a sorority or fraternity, usually there are lots of those experiences that are potential, right? As a student athlete, you're going out to the community doing tons of volunteer things, getting just showing a face. Um, and it's a very similar thing where it's like, oh, there's just all these random things that we've did. How do we kind of aggregate that? And I think potentially under one experience where you put firefighter volunteering,